Welcome back to Bible with Bordeaux. Thank you for joining me for another segment here on the show. So today we're going to be doing part seven of the James Bible study. That's right. We're going to be talking about being doers of the word and what does true religion look like. Religion has got a dirty connotation to it, a dirty name. And so we're going to kind of talk about what James is talking about here. It's not the typical type of religion that we might hear in the common everyday church whenever it gets kind of talked bad about. You know, we always hear we're not in a religion, we're in a relationship with with Yahweh. And so let's let's talk about these things today. So we're going to finish up James chapter 1 and going through verses 22 through the end of the chapter. I think the last verse is 27. So let's read it together here in the ESV and let's dive into it. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once, forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and preserves, bearing no or being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion is that, or religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So, uh, it's going to be a lot of good stuff here today. Let's go ahead and dive into it. Now, we're going to look at this in parallel to Matthew 7 and Luke 6 when Jesus talks about being doers of the word and that those who do what he says are like people who build their house on solid foundation and those who do not have built theirs on sand. So let's look at those scriptures real quick and um, read through those. So Matthew 7, 24 through 27, Jesus here says, everyone who or everyone then who hears the words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house. It did not fall because it had been focused on the rock or founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came, the wind blew and beat against the house and it fell in great Great was the fall of it. So let's look at uh, Luke 6 as well. Again, another parallel uh, kind of a, a meaning here. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house and could not shake it because it had been built well or well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who builds his house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of the house was great. So, a lot of what James says is parallel to the Sermon on the Mount, which we see in Matthew 5-7, through and also here in Luke. And so, the word doer here is actually used five times in the New Testament. Four of those by James, one of those by Paul. And every time it's being used, it's used with the word hear, like it's paired with it. So when we hear or we read God's word, the immediate response should be trying to figure out how it plays out in life. And so it's kind of like whenever a pastor is teaching scripture, he's teaching a sermon or whatever he's teaching. I've always been told, Jason, when you preach a sermon, at the very end of that sermon, you got to imagine there's someone in the back of the, the, the church or the back of the, the group or, you know, whatever kind of setting you're teaching in. And they look at you and they say, so what? What do I do with this? And my wife's been really good about that. So whenever I first started teaching Bible study, like I'd go through the theology, you know, kind of like Paul in the beginning of his letters, he goes through the theological points. But then at the end of the book, at the end of the letters, he typically gives you what do you do with that? Like the practical application of what these uh, this theology means. And so the same way, when we read God's word, we see what he says, we see what he, you know, we study and see what he means, and then we live that out in our day to day. And that's an important thing that we have to do. 
So, and James says that a person who hears the word and doesn't do it is like a man who looks in the mirror and then forgets what he looks like. So the word used for man, it generally means male, the specific word. It doesn't mean like mankind. So men of those times would often not pay attention to their looks or care if something seemed off in regard to what uh, he looked like. So like today, you know, a lot more men are caring about what they look like so they can attract uh, a nice young lady or a nice woman. And so back then, it was not really so much about what the man looked like. It was more about the man got stuff done or whatever, and the women usually cared more about their appearances. And so what, um, sorry, give me one second here. Sorry for the pause there. Let's jump back into it. So again, just to kind of recap, there's usually the men look in the mirror and then they don't really pay attention to what they look like. So, and, but often we would need to look in a mirror to see if anything needs to be corrected. Right. So that's kind of the idea of a mirror. You look in the mirror and you see, okay, this is not what I want to look like. Now the Bible is often a mirror, which shows us our flaws that needs attention and that needs to be corrected. So Romans one through three, the whole entire thing is Paul explaining to everybody whether they were under the law or whether they were not under the law, whether they were under the natural law of God, that everybody falls short. Everybody does. And we look at God, his standards, his ways to see what needs to be fixed. So that's what the Bible does. It shows us what needs attention and what needs to be corrected. And a person who hears the word and doesn't do it is like a person who reads God's word, finds the areas of their life that needs to be corrected and refuses to address it. So that's what James is talking about. So if we do see an area of our life that is not in alignment with God's word, then we should ask the Holy Spirit to help us change that area for the glory of God. So we we know that in and of ourselves, we can't really truly be sanctified. Sanctified is something that the Holy Spirit does within us. So we pray when we see issues. You know, whether you have an issue with lying, with lust, with... Um, you know, pride, arrogance, whatever your issue is, you know, go to God and say, Lord, help me with this issue. You need to recognize that it's wrong. Don't just live with it and accept it and say, this is the way I am, because this is not the way God wants us to be. We we're, were to be sanctified to look more like Christ. So, and often, uh, you know, we're identified outwardly by how we carry ourselves or how people see us live our lives. So, you know, if we're the first fruits of Christ, you know, fruits to be judged or trees to be judged by his fruit, then our actions should reflect him and his word. We should look like Christ because we act like Christ. So people should see, you know, in the in the, the, the early church, people were called little little Christ. Now Christians is like little Christ. It doesn't mean we're 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 Christ, but they're they act like little Christ. They do the things that he did, uh taught the things that he taught. That's what we should be known as. And, and when we look at the mirror, and we see, okay, I'm not being like this at this moment. Those those areas need to be corrected. And uh, and so when we don't look like Christ, it's, it's kind of like Adam in the garden. Like whenever he sinned, he lost the image. And uh, and I'm not I'm not giving you this as solid theological viewpoint. What I'm getting ready to say, so don't don't take it that way. But I heard someone one time say that when God came to the garden after sin happened, and he said, Adam, where are you? He was saying it wasn't because he couldn't find him. Like he couldn't see him because he was hiding. It was because he lost the image that he had in the garden. Like his image changed. And so God at their point was like, hey, I recognize you're not here the way you were. Where are you? Uh, that's just that, that's just kind of a um, theological theory, a viewpoint that someone had. That I thought was interesting. I just thought it was interesting. So, but we're often, um, sorry. So if we look into the perfect law of liberty, we will find freedom. So in John 8, Jesus says, hold on one second. Sorry, it's the wrong one. All right. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So there's, there's freedom. There's liberty in the ways of God. And Jesus is telling us to be truly free is uh, is to obey him. 
So disobeying Christ is sinful, and sin gives you bondage. You know, you're a slave to sin, but in Christ we're free. For in Christ, he's in us, his word abides in us, we live out that word. So, now some may say that the perfect law of Jesus is due to him having been perfectly obeyed the law, like him doing it. And because of that, we are free. We're free because Jesus obeyed the law. We're not a slave to sin. We're free from sin because we're in Christ. This is a true statement. This is true, good, solid theology. However, the reason why I don't think James is, is really saying that here, I'm not saying he's disagreeing with it, but I don't think he's saying that here because he says at the end of the statement, he says that we will be blessed by doing it. So if you do what God tells you to do, you will be blessed by it. Now, this, this teeters along the line, some people may already be thinking it, of, of what people call the prosperity gospel. And so... What I, I want to kind of clarify what I mean. I'm not going to say what the prosperity gospel is, but what I'm saying is that God has a certain way that things function. Jesus tells us, you know, honor your mother and father, um, you know, because they want the good for you. He tells us to obey him, put him first. He tells us a lot of things that are good for us. Like they bless us in a, a spiritual way. And a lot of these blessings are in a physical way as well. Now, I will say that this doesn't mean that if we always do exactly what God tells us, that we'll always get the, the same perfect result that we're looking for. I'm not promising that because we will have trials, we will have tribulations, and that's just the way the world is. We go through hard times. And a lot of things that Jesus taught, that Paul taught, uh, even Proverbs, a proverb is a general truth that when applied, generally you would get the certain result. So for parents, try, or train your child in the way they should go. They would not depart from it. This doesn't mean that your child would never, ever, ever, ever depart from what you train them to do, teach them to do. Like we know this isn't a absolute truth applied to every situation. It's saying in general, when you teach a child, the idea is you teach a child, they learn, they apply it, boom. That, that's the proverb. That's the general truth. And so what, what I am reading here is when we are free, like when we do what God's told us to do, that there is a freedom that's in it. We look into the perfect law of liberty, persevere. We do what he tells us to do. We will be blessed in doing it. That, that's what I see here, and, and that's what I truly believe this is telling us. So let's uh, let's finish this off at 26 and 27. Let's read that again. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, the person's religion is worthless. Religion is pure and undefiled before God the Father. A religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So true religion is this, and it is a good thing. So I just want to say this. I'm not going to tell you you need to start telling people you're religious or you're in a religion. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is when we talk about other religions like Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Confucianism, atheism, uh, different things. We, we recognize them as false religions, which means that we should look at our relationship with the Father. Like our true religion is based on our relationship with Yahweh, with Christ, grace, and, and salvation that's been applied to us. That is the way that I read this true, like I think about true religion. It's true. It's not false. So now I'm not telling you we need to call Christianity religion. The world has classified it as a religion. And I think in general it is a religion, but it is a true religion that is based on uh, absolute truth, which is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, all of the things that are uh, taught to us in Scripture. So that being said, James talks about controlling the tongue here and also in chapter 3. 
Now, uh, the idea of claiming to be religious, like I said, it, it's referring to you saying that you're a follower of Christ in your actions. But if you're acting like a Christian and then you don't control your tongue, your Christian living is kind of worthless. Like people see that as as false. That's what they see as hypocrite. Like you know, you 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 do this or you say this, and you don't they, they don't line up. They don't match. And so you can you can give to the church all day long. But if you're bad mouthing the leaders, you're bad mouthing other people in the church, your giving's kind of useless. It's, it's worthless. You know, you can go and work and work and work and sacrifice time, energy, and effort. But if you're bad mouthing everybody in the process, it, it's really doing no good. Like it's done in vain. So, and then James then explains what pure and genuine religion looks like it means taking care of those who cannot take care of themselves. So, orphans and widows generally did not have provisions to survive. The widow, her husband died. In that time, men were usually the breadwinners. They brought home the things that were needed for the family to survive. Orphans, kids without parents, for whatever reason, they generally couldn't take care of themselves. Now, the age of that in that time might not be the same as today, but ideally, orphans and widows were those who could not take care of themselves. So the idea here is to take the, take care of those who can't. Now, there's plenty of scriptures in the Bible. Now, this is where we're going to kind of differentiate, you know, socialism, capitalism, like the Bible is this, that, and the other. So there's plenty of scriptures in the Bible about those who can work for themselves, who should support themselves, who should work to eat. Those who, who don't work, don't eat. And we're even going to talk about women here too, even widows. Uh, this is not referring, but James is not talking about these individuals. So if we look at 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 5, we see Paul, he, he's talking about widows and taking care of them or what the church should do during that time. This is actually a situation where Paul was saying, this is not the type of widow you take care of. He puts, he puts regulations on it for a reason. So let's read this real quick. 1 Timothy 5, 9 through 13. Let a widow be enrolled, in, and he's talking about enrolled in like a, a, a church caretaking program. Uh, let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one husband, uh, and having a reputation for good works. If she be enrolled, if she, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, if she has been brought up, if she has brought up her children and shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, has devoted herself to every good work, like these are things that you should you should Paul saying require like you should ha have them you know were they part of the church were they godly people did they live for the Lord did they uh, were they good to their their spouse and their kids like all these things is what Paul is saying. So, uh, but refuse to enroll younger widows, for when the passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and this is talking about have uh, sexual relations just with with. With, with anybody. This isn't talking about being married to one husband. Uh, whenever I was trying to research it to make sure, because I didn't understand this to begin with. But ideally, like, and this is a little adult, uh, adult content, but when you're married and you've had sex, you like doing that. It feels good. So when a spouse dies, what he's saying is this person might want to go and continue having sex uh, in a illegitimate fashion. So, uh, verse 12, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith, which is, you know, one woman to, to one man, one man to one woman. Uh, besides that, that and also, too, people were having sex in the name of worshiping other other gods, too. So that's another aspect we got to keep in mind here. Besides that, they learn to uh, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So ideally, what he's saying here is if you have people who are, are well-bodied, they're able-bodied, they can get out and work, they can do for themselves, they should do that. Because if not, they get caught up in trouble. They get caught up in talking bad about people, and he's here specifically identifying this as going house to house, not doing anything, gossip, talking about people, causing issues and confrontations and conflicts, and saying things they shouldn't say. So I would have, verse 14, so I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage the household, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. So again, what I'm not saying here with this uh, passage in James, I don't think James and, and, and Paul 
thinks that we're just to take care of anybody and everybody just because they say they're in need. There is a process that you go through. You know, I've said in a previous Q&A segment that uh, the church is responsible for the church first. You take care of the church, the body of Christ first, and then those outside of the church, you take care of them. But Paul even says within the church, like you want to make sure people are, are busy. They're being, uh, you don't want to be a burden to the church. You don't want to be a burden to the whole body. You know, people should all work, put in, uh, give their best. And so even in the concept of widows, like Paul makes distinctions here. Uh, and I'm not saying, and, and the reason why I think, feel like a lot of people don't say this is because we can become way too overbearing, way too restrictive with this, restrictive with this. And we can put so many parameters on it outside of what Paul was intending in 1 Timothy 5 that we don't take care of anybody. And one of the issues, and I heard a really good uh, discussion from Tim Keller on the Church Leaders podcast. He was talking about the issue that we have in America, uh, really big in America, is you have the idea of complete individualism where everybody is only responsible for themselves. That's it. You don't, you know, you don't need help from, from government. You don't need help from anybody else. We're, we are for ourselves. We take care of ourselves and that's it. If you don't, you die. If you don't work, you don't eat. They take that very little for every individual person and they use that scripture for that. And then you have the other side where everything is complete collectivism where nobody is responsible for themselves. There should be a big body, uh, and, and in most cases, it's government, big government, who is responsible for everybody. And that leads into socialism, communism, that kind of a mindset. And so when we look through scripture, I don't know if maybe I need to do a separate video on this topic or not. Let me know if you'd like me to. But what James, again, he's saying, those who cannot take care of themselves, they're not able to. The church should be there to help take care of them. That's what James is saying here, and that's what Paul talks about in, in uh, his pastoral epistles when he's talking about how the church should function and operate. So, along with that, that, that's a sign of true religion. You take care of people that can't take care of themselves, starting with the body of Christ, then those who are not in the body of Christ. Along with that, we should make sure that the world doesn't corrupt, corrupt us. So we are in the world, like we live here on this, this broken planet, but we are not to let the world corrupt us. We're not to let it sustain us, make us dirty. And that's kind of the idea of being in the world, but not of the world. So Jesus said to the Father in John 17, 15, and um, he, he's, he's actually in prayer at this moment. He's talking to God and he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world talking about the disciples, but that you keep them from the evil one. Why did Jesus say this? Why did he specifically say this? It reminds me of Paul. When Paul says, I'd rather be a home of the Father. It'd be much easier for me just to die and go to heaven and be with Yahweh forever. Like that, that's, that's, that's heaven. That's where I ultimately want to be. But for your sake, I want to stay here and do what I was called to do. So God created us for things. He's got a purpose for our life. He's got plans for us, and we're to be here to do it. But while we're here on earth, we can't let the world corrupt us. And so if we look back at that scripture, it says there uh, to keep oneself unstained from the world. Another reason why I feel like he's saying this is because like the world is all about themselves. They're generally speaking, this is me, you know, like, like Charles Darwin, his, his mindset of survival of the fittest, like it's me or you, it, that, that's the way the world generally typically thinks. It's a very selfish kind of a way to be. And we're going to look more, uh, we're going to look more at, at, uh, the world, what it means, like the world and all that. in James four, four, it's more of like the, the opposite to God and, and Jesus was very selfless. And so we're to be selfless. We're not to be greedy and stingy upon ourselves. And uh, so, and because the world focuses on that so much, like God's saying, don't be, and, and this could be anything. It could be, uh, you know, keep one unstained from the world. Essentially, don't don't conform to the ways of the world. You know, be renewing of the mind. 
But the reason why I say that here is because he's you know, right. He's following the when he said visit and take care of the orphans and widows in their hard times. Like make sure you're taking care of them. So that's why I feel like it's it's letting them know like, hey, make sure you're always thinking of taking care of others and don't be just about yourself. So that's it for James chapter one, uh, part seven of this study. I hope it was helpful. I hope it was beneficial. And look, I know people are going to disagree, uh, especially when it comes to the the taking care, helping people, things like that. Uh, my overall viewpoint is I want to take care of anybody that I can. This, what Paul says in 1 Timothy does talk about enabling. Like you're, you're giving people too much time in a room to, to, to sin, to, to be sinful. Like they should be working. They should be doing something. They should be, you know, helping take care of their family, helping others who are really in need. Like if you're too busy sitting back, receiving when you can be out doing for others, then those who really need to help don't get the help because it's too busy being tied up on those who don't really need help. And, uh, and so, that, but I do feel like, you know, if you see a homeless person, like, the best thing to do is is to give, you know. Otherwise, we would never help anyone because we would question everything about everybody all the time. And so in those moments, I'm like, look, let the Holy Spirit lead you. If you feel inclined to give, I feel like it's better to give and the person might be in need than to not give because the person might not really be in need. Like it's better to do good even when good is not warranted than to not do good if the good is not warranted, if that makes sense. I hope that's clear. I hope you understand my heart, and, and I hope you know where I'm coming from. But I want to thank you so much for tuning in this week. Uh, so what's coming up next? Sorry, this is a little bit longer video than normal. I feel like they're getting longer and longer and longer. So I plan on doing a video. It's a Q&A video about the topic of hell. What is hell? Is, a, is it literal, physical, uh, a moral consciousness? in the lake of fire for all eternity? Is it just a temporary thing? Is it nothingness? Is it only absence of the father? Uh, there's a lot of theories out there on what hell is. I'm going to study the best I can, try to give uh, somewhat of a breakdown of, of different thought points and then share mine as well. That's coming up hopefully in the next couple of weeks. I can't give you a certain due date because it is a lot of studying. I'm going to be, we have the Monday motivational devotionals here on this channel as well. So if you subscribe, you can catch those every Monday, give you a little bit of a boost to your week, hopefully. And also all the Solomon's Porch content that's on this channel. Uh, but thank you all so much. I hope this was helpful and I will see you next time. Thank you so much and God bless.